Avian. So, welcome to part two of our three part series on the Smokebox Big Boy. So, this part uh, we will be focusing on uh, the engineer's tasks uh, while operating the locomotive. So, we'll start off at Laramie and we'll proceed towards Cheyenne. Um, the concept that I've selected today is going to be uh, 4,400 tons behind the tender, uh, which is under the 5,800 ton uh, tonnage rating uh, for the rolling grade coming out of Laramie eastbound. So without further ado, let's load up. Once again, I'll reiterate that uh, if you are new to this uh, DLC, make sure you read the manual uh, before operating this locomotive. Um, it's very complex, a lot of different controls. So you're really going to want to familiarize yourself with everything that you're going to need to be manipulating uh, before you actually start doing stuff. Alright, as I said in the previous video, there's no prior setup needed, um, so anything I do right now is going to be purely personal preference. Alright, so shut up. Shut off the cab lights. Uh, let's see here. Turn the injector light on. Headlight to bright forward. Smoke lifter. Deck light off. Live water injector open. Let's see what else. Uh, cylinder cocks open to start. Close the front coupler. Turn on the headlight beam, control shift H. That's off by default. Um, it turns on automatically if you're in a tunnel but I like to just keep it on. It doesn't really affect my frame rates that, that much, so I'm not really gonna, I don't really, I'm not really bothered by that. Okay, so I think that's everything I do to set this up the way I want it to. Um, so, when you first load into the cab um, of the locomotive, the script automatically applies a full service locomotive brake on the independent handle. The automatic train brake is released. Um, Oh, I did forget. Uh, I don't like running it with the first service on. We'll talk about that later on in the video. Um, so I'll cut that out and we will cut in the brake pressure, the emergency brake pressure control on the locomotive as well. Talk about all the brake stuff later. Okay, so now that you're set up and you're ready to go, um, let's put that gear into full forward position. Two toots on the whistle. Turn on the belt. Crack that throttle slightly. And release your engine brakes. When you first start off, you always want to uh, go real light on the throttle. Um, some engineers will feather it a little bit just to get steam into the steam chest. Um, especially with a very long train such as this, you don't want to drag that throttle too far out when you're starting, otherwise you'll really jolt the rear of the train as the slack runs out. So what I like to do is I like to come to the rear of the train as I'm starting and wait, uh, watch for the slack to come out before I widen that throttle out a little bit more. Alright, 
So the caboose is moving. It means our slack has run out. Starting with the cylinder cocks open um, also helps you to start more smoothly as uh, some of that power is being released through the cylinder cocks. I usually like to keep the cylinder cocks open for about maybe a minute or so uh, before we shut them. Just so you can simulate removing all the water from the steam pipes and the super gears and whatnot. It is possible to uh, slip this locomotive, but since we're starting out of a yard right now, uh, really not required to drag a throttle all that much to stay uh, in under yard speed limits. So you're not really going to slip here. I always like to uh, run the locomotive nice and easy when you first start out in any scenario because um, the fireman has to build that fire and it takes time for the firebox to actually warm up. So if you start off in a scenario and you you try to apply too much power uh, too early on, like within the first eight minutes or so, uh, what you're, you're going to end up doing is actually causing your boiler pressure to drop uh, significantly. Uh, before the fire is actually built up to a temperature that can uh, uh, replenish the steam. So, it's almost fortuitous that we're starting in a yard and that we have to keep our speed limit, uh, our speed down to stay within the yard limits. Um, once the entire train is out on the main line, the fire should be at a state where it won't be affected if we drag that throttle out. For those of you more technically oriented, um, if you look at our fire mass, uh, we're approaching 6,000, um, which is what the I ideal fire mass is set at. Uh, the idle fire mass is, I think, somewhere around 4,900 or 5,000. So that's where you're starting off when the locomotive is fresh into the scenario. Um, so as soon as you crack that throttle open, uh, the fireman will turn on the automatic stoker and start to build the fire.
So, as we approach the green here, um, let's talk a little bit about proper reverse gear setting um, and how that relates to the back pressure gauge here. So, when you're running the locomotive as the engineer and you need to figure out where you want to set your power reverse gear, um, a general rule that you can follow is by watching your back pressure gauge. Uh, specific operating rules uh, specific to this locomotive class uh, stated that the maximum allowable back pressure uh, during normal operation would be 14 to 15 pounds on the gauge. So that would be your uh, uh, benchmark for setting your reverse gear. So now that we're out of the yard, let me see our speed limit is 40. I'm going to widen out on the throttle and we'll watch this uh, procedure in action. You can see my back pressure has climbed um, up to 15. So what I'll do is I'll come back on that reverse gear until that needle falls somewhere between 14 and 15. And so that is how you're going to control where your reverse gear is set by following that rule, keeping the back pressure gauge. Under 15. In real life, uh, this rule would be consistent throughout the entire speed range, but because of the limitations of the simulation in its current form, the higher speed you achieve, the, the lower that number becomes. So as I'm climbing, that maximum rack pressure number for this game is going to drop, start dropping. Uh, let's see, like I have this written down somewhere. So, 15 pounds, that rule holds to about 25 miles an hour, which is where we're at now. And then it drops to 12 pounds at 30 miles an hour, 10 and a half pounds at 40 miles an hour, 10 pounds at 45 miles an hour, 9 pounds at 50, 8 and a half pounds at 55, 7 and a half pounds at 60, and 7 pounds at 65 miles an hour. So, If you remember that rule, you should always be able to set your reverse gear properly for any speed range that you're traveling at. Alternatively, another way to figure out where to set your reverse gear is to uh, watch your fire mass. Stoker is currently maybe shutting it off because the safety is popping. There we go. You want to set your reverse gear where the rate of uh, your stoking rate matches your burn rate in the firebox. Otherwise, if your reverse gear sets you high, what you're actually going to do is cut into your fire and uh, the fire mass will fall until you reach a point where the temperature in the firebox is not high enough to maintain the amount of steam generation that's needed. To feed uh, the demand in the cylinders. So... We're doing 37, so we're coming up to 40, and I set our back pressure rule at 40 was 10 and a half pounds. So we're, we're approaching that, we're, we're somewhere around 11, 10 and a half, 11 now. As you can see, our fire mass is hovering at 5,400, 
which is exactly where we would like it to be for our current level of work. I should come back on the gear a little bit more here. There we go. Alright, so we're traveling on a pretty good clip. We can take a look at... Let's take a look at our forward running gear here, we can talk about a little bit about why they replaced that um, broad actuated setup for the forward mechanical lubrication system. Um, as you can see on the on the rear set of lubricators, this motion here is very smooth. Um, it's a very nice transition from the forward to the uh, rear motion here, back and forth. There's no sudden stops or starts. And momentum is pretty much conserved. This setup is still used on the 4000s today, uh, 4014 today, and also uh, on the 3985 on both engine units. Now, if we look at the forward set, of mechanical lubricators, you can see that this motion is actually very, it's very, it's very choppy. Uh, there's a very distinct forward motion and a rear motion and a pause in between both. So this motion here ended up putting a lot of stress on the, on the rods, which caused them to crack and break, uh, which is why the UP ended up replacing this setup with the change driven system that we see today. Alright, how are we doing? Our fluid pressure is dropping, so we're gonna come down to 35% here. If you look on the quadrant on the wrist here, there's actually uh, notches that are marked on the quadrant. 35%, um, 30%, that was known as the quote unquote the company notch. Uh, that's where they wanted you running this locomotive um, most of the time. So Alright, so we're pretty much we're doing pretty well. We're making track speed here. Um, I'm gonna cut away for a little bit and we'll come back as we're approaching Hermosa.
so we are approaching uh, Hermosa, which is where we will be making a service stop, uh, just so I can go over the braking system here. Uh, one thing I, I didn't mention earlier about making the proper adjustments and settings uh, on your on your throttle and your cutoff is ultimately the goal of running a steam locomotive like this is to find the precise setting on your on your reverse gear where the locomotive will maintain the speed that you want to maintain uh, for as long as the fireman is properly firing the locomotive. So, assuming your gradient is uh, constant, it is possible to find a setting where your throttle and your reverse gear are in the exact positions where the locomotive will do exactly what you want it to do and you don't have to make any changes whatsoever until you come up to a speed limit or a gradient change. So right now, we're climbing at about 35 miles an hour. I have my gear set to about 40% and we're pretty much doing what I want the train to do. We're not losing too much speed, but we're also not set so high on the reverse gear that we're cutting into the fire all that much. Yeah, the easements on this line are pretty bad. Um, so, so the route I'm using for this demonstration here is actually the backdated Sherman Hill route, uh, not the one that's available on Steam. But there's a, a separate website that's hosting this version of the route that's been backdated to the 1950s, uh, specifically for Steam operations. So, I'll include a link uh, to that website in the description. Uh, so that you can download this route and run it if you choose to. I've, I've made further modifications to the route itself to add in water columns where there are water columns uh, along the line and so forth. So, but otherwise it's, this is a, I really like running steam on this route. It is very immersive and realistic. So there's um, the original westbound line going down that way. I was going to cross underneath here. Should be coming up on Hermosa pretty soon, so... I'll start to throttle back. And make a few adjustments here and there. We'll go into more detail about those after we've made that stop.
So we've come to a stop here at Hermosa. We'll let the brakes finish applying and then we'll start talking about how to properly brake on this uh, using this locomotive. Okay, alright, so let's take a look at the controls here. So down here you have your automatic brake handle and your locomotive uh, independent brake um, on this Schedule 8 ET brake stand. Um, it is a manual lap brake setup, so instead of having a continuous service range, you have a release, a running uh, first service lap apply an emergency on the train brake handle. So let's release the brakes here. I think I have enough engine brake uh, applied to the train's not going to roll back on us here. Um, so the standard running position for your automatic brake handle is going to be the running the running position, uh, incidentally, um, that position is going to maintain the equalizing reservoir and brake pipe pressures at 90 pounds, as it is for uh, freight settings. Um, putting the handle in the full release position will actually uh, end up overcharging the brake pipe, which you don't want to do. Um, that is going to cause a whole host of issues that is talked about in the manual. So, I'll wait for the brakes to fully recharge before I run into a demonstration of how to actually properly apply the brakes. Almost there. There we go. Okay, so, when you go to make an application, uh, what you're going to do Assuming your first service position is cut out, which it is now, um, you're going to move it from the running position uh, through the lap positions and into the apply position. Um, a good gauge of how much air you're reducing is by counting the pulses that you hear coming out of the brake stand. Um, each pulse corresponds to about, I want to say about two and a half to three pounds. So if you want to take a minimum reduction of six to eight pounds, you count to you count three pulses, you place the automatic brake handle back on the lap. So like such. One, two, three, lap. You can see our equalizing reservoir pressure has dropped to about eighty-four pounds and the uh, brake pipe pressure will follow it. Alright, there you have a minimum reduction. So, if you're moving along um, and you're taking a minimum reduction, you always want to remember to bail the engine brakes off. So, throw the 
independent brake handle into the release position, um, that'll bail the engine brakes off and keep your uh, slack stretched out so it doesn't all run in on you. You need to take more air, move the handle back into apply for as many uh, pulses as you need. and so forth. Now, it is possible um, to partially release your brakes on this uh, setup. Uh, you might know that these are these brakes are set up as direct release brakes. They're not graduated release, so it's not a true uh, throw it into release and back to lap and you're releasing part of your brakes. Um, what's actually happening is that on a direct release setup with a lengthy train like this, if you put the handle into uh, running to recharge the brakes, the forward part of the train will recharge before the rear of the train does because of the length of the train and the fact that your air source is the locomotive at the head end. Um, so what's actually happening is that you're releasing the brakes on the front of the train while keeping the brakes in the rear of the train applied. So I can demonstrate that now. We can recharge the equalizing reservoir to 84 pounds. The brake pipe follows. as does our average brake cylinder pressure along the entire train. So, that's a partial release. Now, with the engine brakes fully applied, let's go to, a, let's go to release the train brakes here so I can demonstrate the first service position. So what we're going to do is now we're going to cut the first service position cock in. So our first service position is now activated. So the first notch just to the um, right of the running release position on the automatic brake handle is now first service. So what first service does is it uh, applies the brakes at a service rate down to 84 pounds um, and then at a much reduced rate from 84 pounds to 70 pounds. Uh, if you leave the brake handle in the first service position for a long enough period of time, it's about, I think, 90 seconds to 2 minutes or so, it will fully reduce the brake pipe pressure down to 70 pounds. So let's do that. This is useful um, when you're running a pretty lengthy train down uh, a very steep grade. So you're not, you don't have to run that handle all the way over from the running position through the two uh, lap positions into the service position to make an application. You just throw it from the running position directly into the first service, take that initial bite of air um, before throwing it into the lap position uh, and then taking further reductions using the service position. I personally don't like running with the first service position cut in. Um, I tend to try to plan my uh, brake application well enough in advance where I don't have to rely on the first service position. But that's just me, my own personal preference.
Alright, our brakes have finished applying in the first service position. Uh, so now if I move the handle into the lap position, uh, it, it won't do anything obviously, but if I move it back to the first service position, it won't continue to reduce because it, it is at the 70 pounds pipe pressure. Um, if you are going to use the first service position, something to remember is that if you need to release the brakes, you have to remember to cut this uh, first service position cock out because if you move the, if the brake pipe is anything higher than 70 pounds and you move the brake handle from the lap position into the first service to get to the uh, running position, it will inadvertently apply your brakes uh, more before you actually release the brakes. So, if you are going to be actively using the first service position, you do have to pay attention to uh, where your first service cutout cock is placed and what position it is in. So, now, we'll cut this back out. Um, something you might have noticed when I was manipulating the uh, automatic brake is that there are set detents on the brake handle itself. Um, if, if I hold the key control for the brake handle, it'll stop in the next day 10 and it won't let me proceed further on until I've let go, pause for about a second, and then move the handle back again. So when you're making a brake application, you want to be mindful of that mandatory pause period, otherwise you get caught up and you may not be able to apply your brakes in the manner that you want to apply them. So talk a little bit about the uh, independent brake uh, before we move on. Um, obviously you have your running position. Um, to the right is your lap position and then you get slow application and then quick application uh, which is sprung back to the slow application. Same on the other end you have your full release position which is sprung to the running position. So when you bail off just Bail off into the release position, let go, and it'll spring back to the running position there. Okay. Alright, so that's the brake system. Let's turn the automatic fireman back on, prepare to depart Hermosa, um, supply our engine brakes full, set our train brakes running, I think our cylinder cocks are still open, nope, now they're open, okay, good, so, push our gear all the way forward, I don't think I'm going to need sand per se, but we may. I might just make the driver slip on purpose just to demonstrate. Good practice um, when you're starting a train like this is to, especially after a very heavy application, is to set your uh, train brakes into the running position and I'll let them recharge. Uh, until they're almost just about released. That way, you're not waiting forever with the throttle open for the uh, brakes to fully release here. Alright, I think we're just about there.
there's that slack running out here. Uh, let's throttle up a little bit more. Coming up on our Hermosa tunnel, so what we'll do is we will set up our locomotive to run through that tunnel, shut all windows, close all hatches. Close the side vents here. Doors are closing. Perfect. I think that's it. Alright. Alright, and then just before we go into the tunnel. We'll raise our smoke hood, our stack hood. There goes the uh, automatic blowdown. You see the uh, effect in the exterior here. All right. Okay, so now that we're over the hill at Hermosa, shut off the cab lights, open back up the doors, safety vision windows, windows, side windows. Alright, so what I'm going to show you how to do now is uh, set up a drifting throttle. Um, so when you're going down a hill, what you want to do is you want to, first of all, uh, we're going to shut the fireman off. Shut the injector off so that we don't overfill the boiler. The blower here. I'll let the stoker run for a little bit. Uh, because our fire mass is a little low and our boiler pressure is also a little low. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to shut the throttle off, open the cylinder cocks, and then crack the throttle until you see positive, uh, until you see steam coming out of the cylinders. You shut the cylinder cocks, and then you want to double check your back pressure gauge to make sure you're not in the negative values here. Starting to pick up speed down the hill, so we'll apply a minimum brake.
scale off. Shut our stoker off here. Shut our blower down a little bit. So, the main reason that you would set a drifting throttle is uh, to maintain lubrication in the cylinders. Uh, you might know the cylinders are lubricated with hydrostatic oil that is mixed into the uh, live steam as it enters the cylinders. So if you completely shut the throttle off, you're actually cutting off lubrication to the valve stem and cylinders, um, which can be detrimental, obviously, to their structural integrity over a period of time. Additionally, um, you never really want to shut the throttle completely uh, because, as you can see, if I shut the throttle completely, you can, there can be negative back pressure. Obviously, of course, when I'm trying to demonstrate it, it's not doing it now, but um, you never want negative back pressure in the system because that means you are sucking up soot grit. the smoke box uh, back into the cylinders and you, you don't want to do that either because that's, that's introducing contaminants and, and dirt and grime into the uh, otherwise clean cylinders and valve packages and things like that. So positive pressure keeps steam moving through the system, prevents your uh, superheaters from flashing over and overheating. Uh, number of other things as well, but um, you never want to drift the steam locomotive with the throttle completely shut off, unless the steam locomotive is equipped with a drifting valve or uh, any other appliance that would allow you to completely shut off the throttle, but it's good practice never to, to drift with the, with the throttle off anyway. So, starting to go back uphill again, let's turn on the fireman. Widen out the throttle, make our way up to Sherman Hill where we'll make another stop and set. Uh, we'll set, um, I'll show you how to set retainers for that long drift down towards Cheyenne. towers I've added to the route. Uh, this, all, all of the steam servicing facility assets that I've added are from the uh, Penn Coal route, or the uh, BNLE, the Bessemer and Lake Erie route that's now available for free on Railworks America.
Okay, so we're about a mile out from Sherman Hall, so I'm applying the brakes. Set a drifting throttle first. Summit at Sherman Hill. I'm going to try to spot the caboose right at the top of the summit right here. So we're going to pull forward about half a mile or so. Uh, and I'm going to try to get the train to stop with the caboose right about there. Alright, so we have our drifting throttle set. Our back pressure gauge is not in the negatives, which is nice. Uh, let's see, our water's a little low here.
All right, perfect. Look at that. Okay, so our throttle is off. Our brakes are set. Reverse gear to neutral. Apply full engine brakes. Okay. All right, so back in the steam days before the advent of dynamic braking on diesel locomotives, uh, standard practice in mountain divisions for trains starting downhill would be to set a certain number of retainers on the train uh, proportional to the weight of the train. So what a retainer is, is that it's a valve on the, on the, on the freight car that basically toggles a function of the brake cylinder. Um, when your retaining valve is, is, is on, when your brakes are fully released, the brake cylinder actually retains about 10 to 15 pounds of air, um, as would uh, be for a minimum brake. So that way, the engineer can take his drain down a hill with some of the cars permanently in a minimum application. Uh, that way, he doesn't actually have to keep applying and releasing the brakes based on the gradient that the train is traveling down um, and the speed that he is uh, mandated to uh, maintain. So what we'll do, this is a 4,400 ton train, so there, there are quite a few um, loaded box cars on here. We got 71 cars, um, so I think I'll set retainers on the rear Let's see, I guess uh, 20 cars is probably good. We'll, we'll try 20 cars. One, six, seven, Let's do 22. Okay, 22 cars. Perfect. All right, so the retainers are set now on the rear. 22 cars. Um, the east side of Sherman Hill, remember, on the mainline tracks, uh, there are parts of the grade where that are 1.55%. Uh, we do start off on a 0.082%, so this might be actually a few too many retainers for this section of track until so we get to the steeper portion, so I might actually have to apply some power to get this train up to the track speed. Uh, so we'll see. Let's take a look and see how this works out. So we'll release our engine brake and release our train brake, put our gear forward. Since we're going downhill, we don't have to start full gear. We'll keep it around 50%. Wait for our uh, brake pipe to recharge. Check the state of our fire and our uh, water level here, which is, I think, pretty good for downhill action. Double check our cylinder cock status, make sure those are open in case I need to take power. So we are starting to roll just a bit. Oh, the slack stretch out far enough. Uh, so the rear of the train, there we go. Perfect. Apply just a little bit of power to get us rolling.
If we're running up to about 30 miles an hour, then I'll shut off and set it here for throttle. So as you can see here, uh, our brakes are released, our uh, drifting throttle is set, and the retainers are holding the train pretty well to 30 miles an hour. Um, I don't really have to do much, I'm not really wasting air by applying and releasing the brakes here. I will have to do that as we approach the 1.55% grade, but for now, the uh, retainers are doing their job at holding the train to about 30 miles an hour here. Uh, so we'll come back uh, in a little bit uh, as we approach the steeper portion of the grade here. Alright, so we are approaching the steeper part of the grade now, and we're also approaching our upper speed limit here too. So Wyoming Division Special Rules state that uh, maximum train speed uh, drifting downhill is 50 miles an hour. So we should be applying our brakes now just a bit to maintain that speed limit here. Alright, there we go. Holding nice at 50 with the minimum application. I want to make another note about proper operation of the power reverse during drifting motion. Um, standard practice as you watched me uh, do earlier when I'm setting drifting throttles is to shut off the throttle, open the cylinder cocks, crack the throttle a bit so you see steam coming out of the cylinders to verify positive steam flow. and then uh, shutting the cylinder cocks. Now, I didn't talk about the power reverse, but standard practice for the power reverse during drifting was to hook it up just far enough where you minimized rod noise. Um, but also, you gotta remember that the valve stem needs to stay lubricated. So every once in a while, probably about every 10 miles or so, we standard practice to drop the reverse gear all the way down into the corner to allow the lubrication to be spread out across the full length of the valve travel uh, on the valve step. And then after about 10, 10 or 20 seconds or so, uh, hook that reverse gear back up to the previous position. And obviously the faster you're going, the, the farther up you want the reverse gear hooked. Uh, but obviously, once again, not too far so that you're not uh, robbing the 
valve step up proper lubrication. Uh, another way to check to make sure you've set the uh, reverse gear at, and throttle at a proper position is to check your steam chest pressure. When you're drifting, you should be seeing uh, between 20 and 40 pounds in the steam chest, um, as you can see here. So we're, we're pretty set. Your automatic low down again. So we're not going to take the train all the way into Cheyenne, obviously. That's a little bit overkill to go all the way in. Um, I think I've demonstrated the basic tasks required from the engineer. So what we'll do is we'll bring the train to a stop approaching Granite and uh, we'll call it there. A little bit of slack action there. I think we're about like three miles out, so this should be another five minutes or so and then we'll be able to call it. Do a partial release on the brakes here. Alright, there's the uh, home signal for Granite, so we'll apply full service here and see where the train stops.
All right, the brakes are fully applied, so <clears throat> at this point we're just hoping the train stops. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can try. I don't think we're gonna stop before we get to the crossing, but we should stop before the rear of the train goes through the crossing. Remember, this is a 1.5% grade. Um, we are a heavy train, and these are freight train brakes, so. This is a great demonstration of how you really need to plan your stops out well in advance or uh, to maintain control of your train. Because even with the full brake applied, I'm, I'm not really losing that much speed. So. Alright, there you have it. So, uh, this marks the end of part two of our three-part series. Um, on the third part, we will be looking at the fireman's tasks. So, how to keep the firebox uh, fired uh, with the proper level of coal, and also how to maintain the water level in the boiler. Uh, so, stay tuned. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.